as I was thinking about this theme, Jesus, Rabbi, Radical, Redeemer, Risen Lord, a text immediately came to my mind, and it was John chapter 6, starting in verse 53. So if you would mind turning to John chapter 6, starting in verse 53. Mm -hmm. question that I want to talk to us about is a theological question about cannibalism. Great. <laughs> I know we just ate lunch, so I think hopefully it will be okay. And the question is, are Christians cannibals? You know, the early church, they talked about having these love feasts where they were going to eat the body of Jesus. And now many of the non-Christians said, clearly, Christians, they're cannibals. And they would say, by the way, don't believe them because you might be next. <laughs> Eventually, uh, people realized that Christians, okay, well, they're not actually cannibals. They don't eat people. They love each other and they love people around them. But I'm asking this question for us today. Are Christians cannibals? Mm -hmm. Cannibal is simply somebody who eats up another person for their own personal gain. Oh my. They gnaw at, they chew up others by demeaning them in what they say and what they do and how they act. And to be blunt, if we look at the history of our, our nation, we oftentimes especially like cannibalism for people who are of a different color than our yes. own. Amen. So the question is, are people, are Christians cannibals? When Jesus was asked by a group of people, Rabbi, give us something to eat. He said to them a very radical thing. Even crazy. You can follow with me in verse 53. He says to you, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's weird. <laughs> There's a fine line between this. You know, the people come to him and they say, we want, we want some bread. And they say, and you have no life in you unless you eat my body and drink my blood. Mm -hmm. They bristle. You see in verse 60, he actually says, they say, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? <laughs> you see, there is a, an interesting line between what we think of as radical and maybe what's a little bit ridiculous. Some things that are maybe wanting to be cool, but Jesus tells us that's actually kind of crazy. You see, the people were looking to, something, to Jesus for something that was cool, as in radical. But what he gave them was something that was ridiculous and crazy, which is saying you have to eat his body to have life. In fact, he goes on to clarify exactly what he means. And specifically, this radical word of Jesus is related to him being our redeemer. He says in verse 54, clarifying what he means in the positive, he says, the one who feeds on my flesh and the one who drinks my blood, that one has life, eternal life. And then he goes on again and says it again. He says, the one who eats my blood, eats my body and drinks my blood, that one abides with me. Why must we eat Jesus' body and drink his flesh, or drink, drink his blood to have life? You see, Jesus is the only one that can redeem our broken relationship with right. God. And God relates with us covenantally. That's how he's always related to people throughout time. It's kind of, some ways, like a marriage covenant. With my wife, uh, sometimes she reminds me, she says, Jeff, if you ever cheat on me, you're dead. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good wife. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she says, if you break our covenant, you're dead meat. Mm -hmm. In a similar way, we have all cheated on God. That's mm -hmm. And in that covenant, the one who cheats on God, the one who cheats, their blood deserves to be spilled. Mm -hmm. That's how it's worked. But whose blood is spilled? Whose body is broken here? It's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because he is the one who kept the covenant perfectly. 
Mm. He kept that relationship. So when we eat his body, when we drink his blood, and we take that upon ourselves, he takes all of our breaking of that covenant relationship. And we get his covenant relationship keeping. Mm. That means we get union with him. We're connected to him. And if we're united to Christ, I'm united to Christ, you're united to Christ, that means we have union together. That's what the sacrament's about. And so our Christians cannibals can, the question is, can anybody really eat their own body? And yet we tend to be masochistic at times. Mm. Inflicting a great deal of pain by backbiting and gossiping and even denying that some groups are part of the body of Christ. Mm. Yet only Jesus, the risen Lord, is the one who will truly put a stop to our masochistic tendencies on biting our own body. You see, in verse 54, and if you can bear with me for a little bit, he says, I will raise them up on the last day. The one who eats my body and drinks my flesh, I will raise him up on the last day. You see, when we get a taste of Jesus as the risen Lord, we don't have a taste for others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the theological discussions get bogged down on where exactly is Christ in the Lord's Supper? And we know the answer is that he has ascended to heaven, sitting on the right hand of the Father, which is what he says here in, in the following verse. He says, you would see me ascending up to heaven. And that's what the ancient creeds tell us. We believe in Jesus Christ who rose from the grave on the third day, right. ascended to the Father, and sits at the right hand of God the Father. That's where he is. The better question is, where are you in the Lord's Supper? When you come and eat Christ's body and drink his blood, where are you? Calvin would remind us, actually, that you are in a mysterious way. We are ascended up to heaven with Christ. And maybe even the best question about it is, when are we in the Lord's Supper? Mm -hmm. See, it's an eschatological event. See, on the last day we will be risen up. So when are we? We are at that new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem where we will all be worshiping around the throne from every tribe and tongue and language. When you get a taste of that, you get a taste of Jesus who is more satisfying than anything else. You get a bigger appetite, one that can never be satisfied in any other kind of flesh. When you get a taste of this Jesus, this Jesus who is the risen Lord, we get a foretaste of big things that are to come. That's why he says in verse 55, my flesh, my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. The question, are Christians cannibals? Are Christians cannibals? I think the answer to that is that the more that you eat Jesus, the less you're going to eat other people. Mm -hmm. oh, that's good. The more you eat Jesus, yeah. the less you will truly eat other people. Because he says, my flesh is true food. And my blood is true drink. And if you have that, you can't be satisfied in eating up other people. Physically, they were looking for him for bread, but he said, my flesh. That's true food. Mm. Oftentimes, metaphorically, we look to eat up other people from different classes and races and all these things. But he says, don't get that, don't take that pound of flesh. My flesh mm. is true food. I think oftentimes, those who have been oppressed have the greatest witness that Jesus' food is, Jesus' body is true food, and his blood is true drink. They have the greatest witness to that. There was a man in 1941, 1942, his name was Yonichi Matsuda. Mm -hmm. Yonichi Matsuda uh, and his sister were coming home 
from the Vachon Island Methodist Church on Sunday, December 7th, mm -hmm. 1942. Got home, their mother was crying at the table. With face set, their dad said, Japan has attacked Pearl Harbor. You see, Yonichi and his family were Japanese immigrants. His parents immigrated to Washington State before he was born. Mm -hmm. And in what FDR would call a great day of infamy mm -hmm. became one, mm -hmm. in which the United States, white Americans, and FDR did an infamous act by rounding up all of the Japanese mm -hmm. Americans and putting them in internment camps, these prison camps. See, we were getting our pound of flesh. Mm. And in this crazy thing, Yonichi went and fought for freedom from oppression while his family was being oppressed in prison camps. In the 442nd Regiment, he fought. Many of his brothers died. Mm -hmm. Came home after the war, winning the Bronze Medal of Arm, Bronze Medal. Came back to a berry farm that had been mismanaged, run down, and they lost years of their income. Mm -hmm. They'd faced racist comments, all these things. Now, if you were Yonichi, mm -hmm. how would you feel? What would you do? I would have got bitter. I would have got hungry. Mm -hmm. I would want to take my pound of flesh. But you know what? Yonichi was a Christian. Mm -hmm. He loved God. He was known as a man who loved the one who died for his enemies, who gave his body and his blood for his enemies. He loved that one. He, know, he knew that Jesus was his true food. And so then in the early 1950s, Yonichi met a young white um, teenage guy who lived on a smaller island nearby. Came from a broken ham family. His dad was an alcoholic. When he came home, this little boy, this teenager, he ran out into the woods. Yonichi could have ignored him. He could have eaten up this kid just by ignoring him, but not looking at him. But instead, Yonichi paid the fare to get on the ferry and pick up that little kid take him to church. That kid gave his life to the Lord in church because of Yonichi. That kid grew up to be a missionary in Japan, and he had four daughters and 14 grandchildren, and I am the oldest of his grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I stand here before you telling you that I owe my life as a Christian because of a Japanese-American man who was oppressed and sinned against who didn't take his pound of flesh. And instead, he ate Jesus. And because of that, he understood that he didn't need to eat anybody else. It's that simple. The more you eat Jesus, the less you will eat other people. Amen. Amen. Amen.